All right, community groups, we are on week number two of our community group curriculum. Back. Everybody, welcome back. Week number two of our community group curriculum via video, us coming into your living rooms. Um, thanks for coming back. That's great. It's huge to have you back and hope um, your groups this week have gone well. So let's get into things because we have lots to cover uh, yeah. heading into chapter six of Matthew. Yeah, that's like a finally milestone. started in chapter six. That's great. <laughs> Man, I, well, do you have like an average time it takes you to get through a chapter if you're preaching mm. through something? No, I don't. I have no idea how long this stuff takes. It's, you know, the Sermon on the Mount. I think I think I had said someone said, "Do you think you get?" I think I had said Sermon on the Mount might take three months. So yeah. I don't know how long we're into it, but I assume maybe we'll be longer. Because we have chapter there, six though. and we yeah. have chapter seven. This is yeah. this is a formative section of the Bible. I mean, it's, mm. The rest of Matthew is not going to take as long as the Sermon on the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. Is people do. This year is, long sermon series just on this I mean it's there's books written I mean it's yeah. it's pretty shaping revolutionary stuff oh, sure. and so it's it's been good to slow down I mean I don't think I expected to do a week on each beatitude yeah but that's just what happened so yeah, I anyway. love it dude I think it's been great it's, yeah it's pretty taking it's, the time it's changing me I mean it's yeah. You know, my friends and my family are shaken by it sometimes when mm -hmm. I'm sitting around and say hey we're just like ISIS. Oh you know, and, <laughs> yeah, whatever. But, yeah. Uh, but that's how it's changing me, and, yeah. and the, I, I got to try to heed that, heed that stuff, and hopefully, you know, that's helping for you guys too. So. Absolutely, no man, that's great. Yeah, but chapter six. Yep. You know, so we're talking yeah, about it up. giving. So if you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter six. And uh, Jesus is still going. He's still talking about things, and he's getting. He's into still going. <laughs> <laughs> and Jesus is still <laughs> yapping on. <laughs> but he's talking about giving. I mean, yeah. Let's, let's well, read this. Talking about a lot of different things. Yeah, yeah. practicing righteous before mm -hmm. other people. I mean, that's totally. a big. Uh, that's probably a bit. I mean, have you struggled with that about? Oh, absolutely. What your what your private life looks like and what your public life looks like. T yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah. Great place. I'm just gonna start. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's, you're right. It's one of these things where I know in Tell my us heart, your deepest, darkest. Right. Yeah. Secrets. Okay. All right. Here we go. <laughs> but no. But um, you're right. It's for me. I've always had a trouble with seeking the acclaim of other people. Yeah. So I'm a p people pleaser. Like, right. and that's formed me into being a people pleasing coward, where I've just needed to seek the acclaim of people, and it's been hard. Um, especially the whole fearing God, fearing man thing, where I'm not supposed to fear man or right. things like that. And not that it gets me into questionable things, but it puts my heart in a posture that's questionable where I'm doing the right things but potentially for the wrong motivation so right. um, so I could be giving to somebody but it will happen to be at a time that's it's um, mm. strategic it, right. it's like to gain yeah. the acclaim of people around me I'm um, hoping that certain people notice uh, right. I, it's one of those the, and this is the challenge that, that Jesus lays out here he says do it in complete secret so uh, that nobody even knows as yeah. he says you don't let people know what your left hand is doing uh, you, what your right hand is doing. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Yeah. So you give, you give to the church, yeah. or you give to ministry, or you give to the poor. You give to help somebody. You give a car. You give a, you know, one of our friends gave us a car. Very gracious. Yeah. Um, and yet you don't get. I mean, Jesus just comes at the heart of why we do stuff. Yeah. Our motivation is to get the acclaim of people. Totally. And he comes at us, he goes, you can't. You gotta yeah. make it complete. I mean, there's a secret. Yeah. Jesus is telling us there's a secret. Oh, yeah. And your life needs to be a secret. Mm -hmm. So, and I think there's times. Yeah, how's that, how's that challenging for you well, in this world where you like the acclaim of people? And that's just it. Even in, I mean, for me, a huge thing was being even a receptionist here. Like, um, when I came into that, I right. was so identified with who I was and what I had been doing. I mean, my job, my role, um, for wherever I was, I was yeah. a probation officer in Winnipeg. That was big to me. I was in a unit that I loved. This random assault unit was called. It had a, a really cool name. Like, it felt this bravado around What was it, it called? The random assault unit. Random assault Yeah, so unit. we were dealing with people, anybody who had been convicted of robberies, assaults, gotcha. things like that. Yeah. Um, so some pretty real life heavy stuff. And yeah. um, that for me was almost this, my claim to fame of like, I'm successful, I'm doing something that matters, I'm yeah. getting involved. And then to come out here for seminary, um, which was great, we thought it would be a season of preparation and be offered the position of receptionist here at Village that we took. Um, that was hard for me to step into yeah. that because it w there's a lot of things in that job that are thankless. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things in that job that are, and that's not to say the people, it's just you're doing things that are odd jobs in small roles and administration and talking with people, meeting people when they're coming in, making yeah. coffees. Um, just a lot of the practical things that have to happen to make someone feel welcome. And I feel like I was I was good at that. I loved dealing with the we're people. There were things that I really loved about it, but man, as far as the acclaim thing, I struggled a lot with that. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to this, like even just giving or practice, it says like uh, practicing your righteousness before other people. So it's not 
just financially giving or it's not just, you know, oh, when I give this money, I'm just going to put it anonymous on this, you know, like right. uh, on this feed online. So I'm, right. I'm not going to put my name down so I don't right. get any claim. It's actually a heart posture where what you're doing, whether it be your righteous deeds, whether it be how you're doing your job, things like that, you're not seeking to claim, take notice of anything else. The motivation is... Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting in a social media world where... You know, if I post something or something about, hey, I'm hanging out with this church leader or, hey, man, helping out down, you know, whatever it is, my, my, I come before the Lord and there's this tension, right? Like mm. right now, for instance, uh, I'm trying to, I'm writing the Skeptics Forum book and I'm trying to find a, um, uh, a publisher. Mm. And so uh, I've been talking to uh, this particular person who's going to be my agent and and she's talking about, hey, you need to pump up your social media life. You need mm. to get a bigger platform on Twitter and Instagram. And, so, yeah. and there's something about it that feels odd to me. Like, oh, I need to get out there to self-promote or something so that I have more, mm. you know, whatever. So that, But this is the world of publishing today. Is yeah. If you don't have those things, you don't publish a book. Mm. Which is this weird world where, and I told her, I said, look, I don't mind doing it. I don't mind trying to get Twitter followers because I believe in what I'm saying. Yeah. I believe in the message. Sure, I believe it can to be. hear it. So yeah. the more the mayor here, right? Totally. Like but but there's this other piece of me where I'm like, I am first and foremost a local church pastor in yeah. Canada mm -hmm. where people are skeptical about that kind of stuff. And so I'm, I hesitate. Mm -hmm. And so she says, Hey, we need to get it up to 3000. And I'm like, I'm not going to start pumping myself. You know, so there's this weird world where I don't want my righteousness to be public mm -hmm. in the sense that, Hey, look at me, blah, blah. blah. And on the other hand, uh, the way you have influence, and I want to have influence in, in the way of you know, telling people about Jesus yeah. kind of influence, um, is using these social media. So it's a real tension in my life. And it, that's it, how I it's think, kind of played out in, in my life. And we yeah. all have different ways. Well, and I've heard that, that too. Like out. people not wanting to be like, you know, like showing off what they've done or what they can do. And they struggle with this even when they're applying for jobs and interviews and resumes right. where yeah, it's like, yeah. I'm building my resume. Do I put in the volunteer stuff? Like does right. that yeah. take away from the rewards? Is that going right. to be my due reward is getting this job? Because like as chapter six here talks about, it goes into like, man, when you give to someone, don't trumpet like the hypoc hypocrites. Um, it's that you right. may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Yep. I mean, so let's talk about that right now. What are some of the tensions you have in your life specifically regarding this? Like, how do you, what do you do? What needs to be seen? What doesn't? Are you like strategic about it? I mean, I know I've struggled with it, Mark. You said that you, there's things that you've struggled with, the social media, the books, things like that. So what about you guys? All right, guys, welcome back. So we're in chapter six of Matthew. Still got your Bibles out there. I really want to get into something here that really, when I, as I was reading it this last week, it, it just kind of, I mean, what, what is this reward idea? It says, truly I say to you, they have received the reward. So I get that. Okay, yeah. they're getting the praise of somebody in that moment. Yeah. Great, that's what they get. Sure. But then that has a, a turn and we're talking eternity, we're talking other things, reward, like what does that look like? Right. Um, but in the way of, but when you give to the needy, this is chapter, this is verse three. When you give to the needy, do when you give, not if. Right, when, because that's important. Yeah. So maybe yeah. we'll make that distinction right now. Yeah. Like it is when. Yeah, we, I mean, giving um, of our money, of our resources, uh, you know, is, is a massive part of what it looks like to follow Jesus. And this is part of the revolution that he's talking about. I'm a revolutionary leader. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, don't take your resources and hoard them. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of you, uh, and, uh, and you have resources. You're supposed to use them toward kingdom things. So if you take the whole Bible, you take the New Testament, you take Paul, you take, you know, we're supposed to give some of our money to the local church. Um, uh, not necessarily a number, but a, a spirit, uh, uh, some of, some of us, 10% would be too low. Mm -hmm. Uh, so don't make it, you know, you can make that kind of a target that you orbit around, but, um, for some of us, 10% is nothing. You need to go 20. Yeah. Uh, it needs to be sacrificial. Mm -hmm. Paul talks about in first Corinthians nine, it needs to be, uh, generous. It, you know, you need to feel it. It needs yeah. to be, uh, continuous. It needs mm -hmm. to be often. So there needs to be this giving aspect to the local church. There's things that we do. There's. There's, uh, there's people to pay and lights to keep on and mission, you know, global missionaries and local mission stuff yeah. that we're doing, you know, all this kind of stuff. And this is a, a conduit through which we give, you know, the lo giving to the local church is a conduit through which we give to the needy mm -hmm. in our life. Um, and some of us hoard this stuff. I remember, uh, you know, uh, Rick Warren, we were down listening to Rick Warren a couple yeah. years ago. That's good. He talks about the idea that, you know, I, he said, I sold the sec second most bought 
book of all time. I mean, he's like got second more, to the Bible, more translations, Bible, yeah. worldwide, the purpose driven life, life yeah. sold he, more. He has more money than he knows what to do with. Yeah. And he says, so what I did is I paid back my church everything they ever paid me. I reverse tithe. Yeah. Uh, he keeps 10%, gives away 90. He has the same truck, the same house he had. Change, you know, doesn't 20 change his lifestyle. Doesn't change his lifestyle. And he said, so I have more money to give. And he said, the reason God did that with me is because mm. he knew what I did when I had, because people say, well, I would do that if I had money. Yeah. He says, no, you wouldn't. God knew what I would do with the money because he'd seen what I'd done with it already when I, when I didn't have any. Yeah. He saw what I did with the money. I was generous. I, was, I gave to the needy. I gave to the local church. In fact, this is a crazy thing. Rick Warren back in the day before he was the richest man in the world, uh, <laughs> he said, and this is crazy because he was planting in Southern California, Orange County, where there would be lots of money. Yeah. He said, no one will ever outgive me in my church from the first day. He in started California, the church. like that, man. No one will ever outgive me as the planter. And I read read that. I, went, I can't make that. Like I can't make that promise because there's going to be people in our church that give more than me based on what they how much money they make. Totally. And he said from the beginning, <laughs> yeah. no one will look. And then he becomes the richest man in the world. And he's like, ah, here, take all my money. I work for free for forty years. Oh, um, wow. Pretty mind boggling. But he said the reason God. In that gave resource me with that kind of money yeah. is because he knew what I'd do with it already. And so if you're waiting till you have money, mm-hmm. your your practices right now in regard to your generosity are the only thing that's telling you about what you're going to do with it in the future. Yeah, he said you, generous with little, generous with much. It was yeah. that kind of like yeah. your heart where it's at now, that's not going to change as you get more money or no, as things start no. settling with you. Yeah, so the generosity is really important. Yeah. Um, as I talked about, the the idea of the monkey holding the, you know, the coconut mm. and the nuts. And, and, he, and it's only when you let the nuts go that you get, your hand gets out and you get free. You get free in life. You get free in life when mm. you're generous. You, you open yourself up. So yeah. I think this is what Jesus talked about. Now, when it comes to the reward. Yeah, that's what I wanted to get yeah. into for sure. Yeah. yeah, the reward. Jesus talks about rewards throughout his ministry. Um, and what, what I think he's talking about is the sense of reward that's going to come in heaven. That heaven won't be uh, sometimes what we, we think about heaven and hell as this kind of uh, straight line, everybody's in the exact same scenario. Mm-hmm. I think the Bible alludes to the fact that people will experience different levels of glory, yeah. different levels of intensification of mm-hmm. heaven and different levels of intensification, intensification of hell, different uh, levels of reward, different levels of punishment. Yeah. And so whether it's the sheep and the goats, well, all, all these images Jesus gives. And I'll give you one, um, one example. Uh, if you go to John chapter 5, um, in John 5, Jesus is talking about the resurrection of the dead. Um, and he's talking about uh, really what what the end is going to look like, mm. and uh, and in, in, in almost every passage in the New Testament that talks about the judgment in the end, yeah. uh, whether it's Revelation twenty one or Romans chapter two or John chapter five, I mean, this is one example. Uh, Matthew twenty five, where he's sheep and the goats. Mm. There's this honing in on what people do. Yeah. With their life. And so he says, an hour is coming, John 5, 25. And now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live for as the Father has life in himself so has granted the Son also to have life in himself and he's given his authority to execute judgment because he's a Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. An hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. Mm. Everyone dead will hear the voice of Jesus and come out. And those who have, look at that, done good, to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So right there we have this level of, okay, well, what do you mean? What I've done affects the judgment and affects the life. Yeah. What I've done. Yeah. Romans 2, same thing. Sheep and the goats, same thing. What you do, what you do, what you do. And so so what we have is, of course, you're saved by your what you believe, yeah. not what you do. Totally. You've believed in Jesus. Yep. You've trusted in Jesus. But now you're saved, then what? Yeah. Well, there's this other evaluation of your life, which is what you've done mm-hmm. and your experience of heaven, or if you go to hell, your experience of hell. So there's a justice in the judgment where not everyone's going to be judged the same as Hitler. The mm-hmm. random Joe Blow is not going to experience as awful a torment mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. as Hitler. It won't be good by any means. There's yeah. no, you know, there's no good hell. Like, there's no yeah, good hell. Yeah. There's no good hell. And, uh, and then there's this reward and what are you talking about? There's these rewards in heaven. 
And so he gives these parables all through his ministry where he mm. talks about, you know, if you've done, like you said, if you've done good with a little, I'll give you a city and I give you five cities. I mean, and there's going to be this, this, this experience of heaven um, that's based on what we did here. Mm. There's a level of reward. Paul talks in, in Corinthians about some people are going to get in like through, cause they're building on gold and some people get in like skin of their teeth through yeah. the stubble. Like they got burned through and there's like a little fire singe behind them. And yeah. it's like, Hey, you're in, <laughs> it's but like dude, what out. in the world were you about? Yeah. Um, so that's what he's talking about rewards. So there's going to be rewards mm. in our life. It's not about, it's not about the means. Here's a, here's a distinction Tim Keller makes. It's not the means of salvation, mm -hmm. but it is the trajectory of salvation mm -hmm. or, or where your salvation has to go. Yeah. So you're not saved by what you do. Totally. But if you are saved, it affects what you do, yeah. and it should. And the more good you do here, the more it echoes out into the eternal world. So that's what he's talking about yeah. when he's talking about rewards. And he brings it up over and over again, even through the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, well, let, let's even take some time now in our yeah. groups, discuss what that looks like. I mean, how what does it mean to do good? And what's the hope and the motivation to actually think eternity? I mean, let's just discuss that because there's some great points to talk about. All right, so Jesus talks about this idea about praying um, like the hypocrites and the hypocrite of course is a play actor um, tell me so he says when you pray again mm -hmm. there's this assumption yeah uh, tell me about your prayer life well what, is, what does that look like uh, you know struggles strengths yeah. how have you wrestled with your prayer life and getting it to a place where you feel it's healthy yeah because I, I guarantee everyone out there and this is one of the biggest yeah. struggles I went through a lot of change um, recently as far as when God put this call on my life to get into ministry. Um, praying in ministry is something you do often. You're praying with people you're wanting to. I mean, there's a mental shift that allows you to say, I will pray for people right here, right now. So I think the first thing, the biggest thing for me was actually deciding, coming to a place. And this was intentional to say, I'm going to pray for somebody in that moment. If they're talking to me about something that's going on in their life, yeah. we're not going. They're not going to walk away from that conversation. Like in the coffee with, shop, right? Wherever within, you are, wherever yeah. you are, yeah, yeah, and wherever you are. Which I, I'll get into a little bit of how that yeah. some of the things I struggle with that. But um, it's yeah, you need to actually take the time to pray for people in the moment you're yeah. with them. And sometimes it's not good enough to say well, I'll pray for you later because we get busy and then you just don't. And I think people can identify and recognize that, that sometimes yeah. as Christians, it's a bit of a cop-out too, to be like, hey, I'll pray for you for that. And we can throw that term out and it seems to give this little sense of comfort saying, hey, we care for you or we're there for you. Yeah. I, I want to empathize with what you're going through. But the actual practice of praying is something that takes a lot more time and intention. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what I've found for myself, because I'm busy and I meet lots of people and things like that, is to actually pray for the person in that meeting, in, in that, that time, yep. in that moment that I'm with them. And so that's something that for me sincerely, has um, been huge in my life and actually actually praying for people. Um, or I actually heard in a group, I was talking to someone yesterday and they said in their community group, um, what they did, what the leader challenged all the couples to do was he said, here's what I want. I yeah. want us to commit to 30 days of praying with our spouse. It doesn't have to be 40 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> of praying with our spouse out loud in the house um, get to that. And yeah. just have a day where you, not, not a full day, where yeah. every, there's a moment in every day for 30 days where you pray out loud. And one of the spells, like, I don't do it, he can, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but there's a moment for 30 days where they committed as a group to pray together out loud. And I think it's beautiful. It, it, it's it is. It challenge. absolutely is. And uh, it's good, it, the challenge is the word. Um, when you actually think of and actually practically do that. I know for me and Mercedes, my wife, when we started praying together, it felt extremely awkward. Like, yeah, like kissing we, your sister. Well... <laughs> Not that awkward, no. Right. <laughs> but um, not that I no, yeah, no, it's just not that awkward. But it's um, one of those do you have things. A sister? I do. Yeah, yeah, younger sister. She's awesome. Cool. But um, not awesome enough to kiss. Um, so well, not me at least. Anyways, <laughs> so we uh, yeah, when Mercedes and I were starting to pray with each other for the first time, it was this really difficult um thing of being comfortable with another person, yeah. praying for them out loud, um, spending time like, and it was often in the quiet. Like, so we'd be in bed at the end of the night together, and mm -hmm. we just like cuddle and pray, and that for us was a big um, moment right. and it took time to get there um, yeah. and to be comfortable with us just praying. Even having Mercedes <clears throat> pray for me out loud where I was hearing it, um, 
it was just different. I just hadn't experienced it. We mm-hmm. hadn't put an emphasis to that. So there is something about saying, okay, yeah, pray with your spouse and then actually praying with your spouse. Mm-hmm. And But here's the thing. In our relationship, um, there's been some extremely profound moments where when we're actually praying with each other, like the person's heart comes out in a different way. Yeah. It causes you to be still with your spouse. I mean, life is busy. You can be doing lots of things next to each other, but not things with each other. And um, when we were actually spending that time praying with each other, it's, man, those are the moments where you hear what their struggles their are, what their, heart, yeah. their concerns for you, yeah. um, what they're perceiving in situations. And it comes out because they're being authentic with a God that they know knows them and loves them more mm-hmm. than you even do. Mm-hmm. Um, so for us that, yeah, those moments, man, praying over my kids at night, um, making them an active part. And, uh, my son, Jacob, he always wants every single night. We, we read the Bible and then we'll pray after before he goes to bed. And I always have him praying. He always wants me to pray for scary things. that like he doesn't see scary things and things like that. So there's kind of this routine where he's like, I don't want to see scary things. I don't want to, that kind of thing. And so I pray over him and I pray with him. Um, but man, praying with your kids is so fun. Like, because the stuff they pray for is like the sweetest, oh, yeah. most ridiculous things. And yeah. yet it's this childlike authenticity that yeah. only comes. And so even when the Bible's talking about like being a child, like having a childlike faith, like faith where you come to mm-hmm. come to God as a child. And I see that and I see the, the mm-hmm. realness of that and the rawness that kids have with just being themselves. And yeah. that comes out in their prayer life and stuff too. It really is. Yeah. Um, yeah, so praying for people in the moment, praying with your spouse, praying with your kids, and then your own personal prayer life. I think that's a continuous thing. I just find myself, I sometimes even have trouble differentiating when I'm just talking to myself in my head or I'm talking to God because um, yeah. it just happens and it just comes with the flows of life. And um, But I think you do have to put time aside to be in the word and prayerful about it because when I'm reading this, it convicts me and that's when I need to be really praying about what's yeah. going on that God would actively change my heart because it's, it's an, and it's an everyday thing. Mm-hmm. You have to have that. And I'd say practically speaking, for those of you who are new to prayer or new to Christianity, um, you know, there's some ways that you can, you know, just speak to God mm-hmm. as, you know, you're talking to whatever and it doesn't have to be some, and that's the whole point of what Jesus is saying. It doesn't yeah. have to be some religious. Yeah. Um, but one of the things, if you're looking for a way to get discipline, is pray through the Psalms out loud. Mm. Uh, the Psalms is the church's prayer book. And, uh, and so if you're like, I don't know what to do, open Psalm 1, read it out loud, say amen. Next day, open Psalm 2, read it out loud, say amen. And you start praying through the Psalms every month or every couple That's months. Good. Um, you know, it's really helpful and helps to shape your theology and helps mm-hmm. to, you know, there's down times where David's like, I hate God and I don't know what to do in my life. And then there's like, oh, the sweetness of the Lord, you know, yeah. and, the, and the two Psalms press up against each yeah. other. So, um, so that's real kind of rhythm of life stuff. So that would be a practical mm-hmm. thing for you guys. So why don't you guys talk about, uh, you know, Carl Barth talked about the idea that the most revolutionary posture is folded hands in prayer. Yeah. Talk yeah. about how prayer can be revolutionary, not sentimental, not mm-hmm. kind of this Christian-y kind of, but real revolutionary um, change life, change culture kind of thing. Um, and how, and then pray, uh, you know, into that for one another, uh, that your guys' prayer life would increase and it wouldn't be something that's just external, Mm -hmm. um, kind of religiosity. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll end there. And again, pray, you know, Jesus whole assumption here is that there's power in it. Mm -hmm. Uh, so keep praying for those people, uh, that we prayed for last week.